Grace and peace to you in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We gather here today in the sure and certain hope of the resurrection to eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord, and to give thanks to God for the life of Brad Crane, to receive the comfort of the Holy Spirit, and to proclaim the good news of eternal life. Let us pray. Eternal God, our Heavenly Father, who loves us with an everlasting love, Help us now to wait upon you with reverent and believing hearts. In the silence of this time, speak to us of eternal things, that through the patience and comfort of the scriptures, we may have hope to the light and peace of your presence. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Our opening hymn is number 169, and we invite you to stand as you are able. expresses God's care for us in every circumstance of life. I lift my eyes to the hills. From where will my help come? My help comes from the Lord, who made heaven and earth. He will not let your foot be moved. He who keeps you will not slumber. He who keeps Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord is your keeper. The Lord is your shade at your right hand. The sun shall not strike you by day nor the moon by night. The Lord will keep you from all evil. He will keep your life. 
The Lord will keep your going out and your coming in from this time on and forevermore. And now hear these words from the prophet Isaiah, chapter 40, verses 28 through 31. Have you not known? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He does not, grow, he does not faint or grow weary. His understanding is unsearchable. He gives power to the faint and strengthens the powerless. Even youths will faint and be weary, and the young will fall exhausted. But those who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. And now these wonderful verses from Romans chapter 8. We know that all things work together for good for those who love God, who are called according to his purpose. What then are we to say about these things? If God is for us, who is against us? He who did not withhold his own son, but gave him up for all of us, will he not with him also give us everything else? Who will separate us from the love of Christ? Will hardship or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? No, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life nor angels nor rulers nor things present nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. And our last scripture from the Gospel of John, chapter 14, which assures us of our home with God and Christ's peace. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house there are many dwelling places. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself, so that where I am, there you may be also and you know the place that where I am going. I have, said these to you, I have said these things to you while I am still with you. Peace I leave you, my peace I give to you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not let them be afraid. This is the word of our God. Thanks be to God. For my meditation, I would like to read from 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 6 through 8. Paul writes, For I am already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure has come. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the course. I have kept the faith. In the future there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord will award me on that day, and not only to me, but also to all who have longed for his appearing. Thanks be to God for God's word. Will you pray with me? May the words of my mouth and the meditation of all our hearts be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Here in this passage from Paul, you notice that the Apostle is taking some time to give us a description of what it means to live a life well. As he talks about life, he doesn't focus on social standing or material wealth. The focus of the text is on the person, the person who, whose whole life is lived in such a way that in its totality, it is the praise and worship of the risen Christ. 
Paul says, as for me, my life is already being poured out as an offering to God. He recognized that the imagery here is of a container of wine that is brought before the altar in the holy temple of the living God and then poured out as an act of worship. We can see that what Paul is saying here is that his life in its totality is an act of worship. It is poured out completely in worship and in praise to the living God. And so it was with the life of bread. He didn't live his life with long and short spurts of faith and service to the Lord. No, his life was lo one long, continuous act of worship and service to the Lord. As a young boy, he began singing his praise to the Lord in choir. And one of his greatest joys was in making music with his fellow choir members, no matter where he was. We're thankful uh, for the many years that he sang in this choir loft with us and in, had his voice me meld with all of ours in our joyful praise and worship. We're thankful for the ways that he gave to us and served the Lord in worship. And I don't think Brad knew how to serve the Lord in any other way than by giving his whole life and his very best. For Brad, his life be belonged to the Lord. So no matter how he felt, he served with music. No matter what he had or what he did not have, he sang. No matter what the circumstances of his human situation at the moment, he sang. He also knew what Paul talked about in this passage. He knew that the time of his departure had come. Brad lived a rich, long life, yet at the end he knew it, it was his time and he had also come to go to be with the Lord. Sometimes when a loved one dies, we say that they are at rest. And now Brad is at rest. But I suggest to you that Brad is not at rest because he got tired or decided to rest. No, Brad entered his rest because he had finished his mission. Brad entered his rest because he had finished his job. His mission was done. All was completed. And that's a good thing. He fought the good fight of faith every day of his life. And now he can rest in the comfort of completing the race of this life. When we speak of a life worth living in this world, we often point to great accomplishments or wealth or fame. But keep in mind, that when the Lord surveys a life for the crown of righteousness, the most important accomplishments are not the ones listed in the newspaper headlines, but in the hearts of those who Brad loved. In fact, many of the great labors of love are only known to God alone. There are many labors of Brad's love that we know. He was faithful and devoted husband to Annabelle, and in many ways, they completed one another, and their love for each other was to be admired. He had a wonderful, close relationship with his nieces and nephews and brothers and all of his family, and they will be sore, he will be sorely missed. Brad was the kind of person that always put family first, and he was always doing things for others. He was always there when you needed him. I'm sure all of you here have wonderful memories of Brad. Uh, the family will remember his love for the family cabin on Crystal Lake in Michigan and his love of taking the sailboat out on the lake. And Brad loved his churches, especially he was active at Georgetown Presbyterian Church and here at Williamsburg. Could you even imagine how many anthems Brad sang in his lifetime? I can't imagine, but all with joy in his heart. Brad loved choral classical music, and he added his deep voice to Williamsburg Choral Guild. Brad had a strong faith in the Lord, so when his time came, he was not afraid. He knew that there was in store for him a crown of righteousness, for he had fought the good fight. He had finished the race. A life well lived in this present world is all about the love one shares. 
about the service one offers to the Lord. That person who lives well in this present world is one who has taken his life to the Lord and surrendered his life to him. As Paul writes in Romans, we present our bodies as living sacrifices, holy and acceptable to God. Brad gave his life to the Lord, and Christ honored his faith. A life well lived is a life lived out as, as an expression of worship and praise to the living Christ. Friends, we can be sure that Brad's God's faithful servant has fought the good fight. He has finished the course. He has kept the faith and now has received the crown of righteousness laid up for him. Thanks be to God for the life of Brad Crane. Amen.
We give thanks to God for our memories, uh, for they are a blessing to us, and they call to mind uh, the love and the tenderness and the grace that we've experienced in other people's lives. And so now we come to a time of remembering with thanksgiving to God. And first I'd call, like to call upon Marilyn Winter. There's a place in the state of Michigan, in the northwest part of the state, that was where Brad and Annabelle and all of the Crane family had as their cottage and their, what would be called their summer home. If you can imagine the state of Michigan, which for those of us who go up there all the time, we talk of it as the mitten. This is the lower peninsula, not the upper part. That's the UP. But in the Mitten, and if you think of the Mitten, the capital is here in Lansing, and up over here on this side, where this finger comes, here is Traverse City, Michigan. The Crane's Cottage and my family cottage is over about here, outside of the town of Frankfurt, on a beautiful lake called Crystal Lake. And if you can imagine, starting about here in Manistee, you drive up on a highway called M22 that follows the coast of Lake Michigan, goes north, and goes up to Northport. It's about a 75-mile drive. It goes through beautiful second-growth forests of beech and maple, ash, although now they are dying because of the emerald ash borer, but pine trees, spruce trees, over sand dune hills, which is what is left of the glacial, it is the glacial moraine from when the ice age retreated and the deposits left hills and in those hills are beautiful pristine lakes that are deep, beautiful blue when the sky is blue. M22 winds up through a little town called Frankfurt. It's a very small town and outside of Frankfurt to the north, about two miles north, M22 comes to Crystal Lake and it follows the western and northern shore of Crystal Lake. It was on M22 that the Crane Cottage was located. The front door faced on the highway, the back part of the house, which had a lovely place to eat, and you could look out toward Crystal Lake. You could see the beach or the grass on the sand going down, and they had a they, have a, they had a beach, a dock, a boathouse. And that I just wanted to have a setting for you of why Michigan was so important to the Crane family, to Brad, and to my family. Because our families intertwined in an amazing way over the years. I didn't meet Brad until 1958 when he had graduated from Princeton. And he and his brother Steve and Bob were up there with his parents. That was not the first time I'd had interaction, an interaction with the Cranes. When I was a little girl, my family started going up to a place very near the Crane Cottage called the, the Congregational Summer Assembly. This assembly was established in 1901 by the Congregational Conference in Cleveland, Ohio as a kind of Chautauqua for teachers and ministers who could go up to the beautiful, pristine area of northern Michigan and enjoy spiritual renewal, enjoy activities for families, cultural activities, etc. My family had started going there in 1947. My father was a Presbyterian minister. So as a PK, I went where my parents did, obviously. And we went, rented a cottage back in the woods to the western side of M22, back in the dark woods, because there were only three cottages back there. And it was scary, because there was a road that went all the way down to Lake Michigan that Bob Crane remembers. And because he used to run there when he was growing up there too. But there were no lights past where we stayed. And the problem was that if we wanted to go down to the beach for the Congregational Summer Assembly, we either had to walk on M22, which is a Michigan State Highway, 
Or we could cross the highway and go by a cottage, the Crane Cottage, go on their path, get to their beach, and then we could walk along the beach to the assembly beach and we could take our tennis lessons and our swimming lessons. And so my father, being the kind of forthright man he was, knocked on the door of the Crane Cottage and asks, asked Aunt Edith and Aunt Helen if his family, the children of his family, could walk by their cottage, have permission to go on their property. And so when I was four and until I was uh, t uh, nine, I walked by the Crane Cottage. I only knew that it was the Crane Cottage. I didn't know the people inside. But in the summer of 1958, I came up and my sister was uh, going to be a junior in college. I was going to be a junior in high school. And I made again an acquaintance with Brad's younger brother, Steve. I had met Steve two years before playing tennis on the Crystal Lake courts. And we had had fun, a fun time doing backboard tennis at night. The next summer, Steve wasn't there. And what I didn't know at the time was that he had contracted polio. And so they, they did not come up that summer. But in the summer of 1958, they came up. And my sister and I had the pleasure of doing things with Steve and Brad, riding around in their Carmen Ghia little car, and doing some of the things that Brad loved most. He loved sailing. Well, his lightning was up at Crystal Lake by then. And on one fortuitous day, we, we sailed Brad, sailed the lightning down to the other end of the lake, which was eight miles away, to go to the movies. There was a movie theater in the little town of Beulah. We sailed down. Well, the only problem was that when we got done with the movie, it was dark, and we had to sail back. Well, there weren't that many cottages on the lake at that time, and there was really no way to know where the crane cottage in the dock was. And so we sailed along the northern shore looking for it, finally found the Crane Cottage dock, and I got home well after midnight. Thank heavens my father was in Japan that summer, and only my <laughs> mother was there. And so she, you know, she sort of woke up. I was with my older sister, oh, it was fine, and thank heavens my dad wasn't there. Could have been really bad. But anyway, and so I got an experience of sailing with, with Brad. I sailed later with his family on Lake Michigan as well in the lightning. But anyway, another adventure from that summer of 1958, Brad and Steve sang in the choir at the Congregational Summer Assembly. Now the assembly was right next to their cottage, less than a quarter eighth of a mile away. And one of Brad's the things that he loved about going to Michigan was singing in the choir at the Congregational Summer Assembly on Sundays. We have a choir of between 40 and 80 people with people who come from all over the United States and in some cases all over the world who come back every summer and sing. And Brad and Bob and Steve and Brad's older brother Bill would sing in the choir whenever they were up in Michigan during the summer. Well, we got the, the incredible idea. We were working on How Lovely Is Thy Dwelling Place from the Brahms Requiem. And we decided that we had all the voice parts. And so we would sing. And we would go and sing How Lovely Is Thy Dwelling Place. Well, the only thing about the North Woods, or any time if you've been in the woods, is that sound travels terribly. And we didn't think about the fact that it was 11 o'clock at night. And so we went down. The piano was outside, not inside the meeting house, because the meeting house had collapsed. It was a very old building, and the snow had made it collapse. And the only thing that was left was the stage, which was like the chancel, where we did plays and things, but it was also where the service was held, and a concrete, lovely sounding board, concrete basement that was there. So we proceeded to sing in four points. How lovely is thy dwelling place? Well, down from the hill above stomped the manager from the assembly, Tom Williams, saying, do you realize what time it is? 
And it was like, oh my goodness. A good, a good thing again that my father wasn't there because he and Tom were friends. So we had a memorable summer that summer. I didn't see, see Brad a lot after that because we weren't there at the same time. I saw Steve more. I saw Bob intermittently. Um, and Steve, Steve and I remain, remain very, very good friends. And, uh, but as the summers went by, I met Annabelle after they were married. They would sing in the choir and we did happen to cross paths, which was wonderful. My friendship with Brad and Annabelle really didn't grow until after we moved to Maryland in uh, 1999. And at that time they were still in, in DC at the Georgetown Presbyterian Church. And um, we would meet them, we met for, uh, we met for a dinner in Annapolis. Uh, Brad, as the loving brother he was, would bring Steve over and we would meet for dinner. Or um, Also, he brought Steve to concerts that our daughters, my husband and I have two daughters, they're both sopranos and they do recitals. And um, uh, Brad brought Steve over to make sure that he could do these things too. And once I had retired, and was no longer, longer having to get back to teach in school, then we were up in Michigan when Brad and Annabelle were. And so we were able to see them more, had a lovely dinner at their cottage, at the Crane Cottage, um, and, and so our friendship grew. Uh, imagine our surprise about five years ago when a new couple joined our choir, because Brian and I both sing in the choir. And it, it turned out to be friends of Annabelle and Brad's from the Georgetown Presbyterian Church Choir, the Harrises. And Annabelle had realized this and had made sure that we connected. And after we met them, Brad and Annabelle came to a Broadway night, stayed with, stayed with the Harrises. We had a lovely dinner at the Harrises' house beforehand. And so these things developed over time. One other interesting thing about my interaction with the Crane family was that Brad's, when Brad's parents and the family moved to Cincinnati, out to Loveland, Ohio, and what uh, Bob always refers to, and they did too, as the farm, we actually stayed there one evening um, because the Crane, Brad's parents had joined Knox Presbyterian Church in Cincinnati, which was the church that my father served. And I was born in Cincinnati. And so when that became known, my parents became friends with the Cranes, the older Cranes. So our family has been intertwined all of these years. I'd like to share with you um, something from my daughters because the last time that we saw Steve and Brad together was when Brad brought Steve over to First Presbyterian Church in Annapolis, where we are members, and our daughters were doing a recital there. And Brad and Annabelle brought Steve. Steve was not well. We did not know that Brad was also not doing very well at that time. Um, and he brought them over. Steve spent the night with us. Um, and. And so our daughters also grew up knowing the Cranes, knowing Brad, knowing Annabelle in the relationship that they had when the Cranes would come to visit in Annapolis. And I'd like to read what they, what they said about Brad, because I asked them. I said, what would, you, what would you say about Brad? And it so much reflects what I feel, and I know my entire family feels. Our daughter, Erin, said, I was always struck by his quiet, calm, and uh, his quiet, kind, and calm demeanor, but mostly by the devotion and love he showed for Annabelle. And Shannon, who is the elder of the two by two years and one day, said, he was kind, gentle, loving. He had a very caring smile, and he was a good listener. You could tell that he truly cared about what you were sharing with him. It meant so much to me that he and Annabelle made a point to come to our recitals over the years. 
My own thoughts go along with them. He was so dedicated to his family and talking with Bob and learning more about what they did as brothers. He was such a loving brother, so caring, so doing things for them to, to let them accomplish what they wanted to do. And um, that was just manifested in so many ways. Uh, he was always making sure that, they, that their needs were, were fulfilled. I loved his intellect, his, his great knowledge you get on a topic and then he could start talking about it. But it was never that he had to show how much he knew. It was just that he was interested in the topic and he was interested in finding out what you, and, you knew about it too. My family will go back to Michigan this summer. We make our pilgrimage. It's 800 miles from where we live outside of Annapolis. But we always go back up north because it is a special, special place. And it is a place where my life is, all of my memories are so connected to the Crane family. We will drive by his cottage. Well, it's not their cottage anymore. It was sold two years ago. And the, the buyer assured Annabelle that it would not be taken down and built into some kind of a magnificent house because now you don't have cottages anymore in Michigan. If you tear it down or if you build something entirely new, it all has to be to code. So everything has furnaces and I mean, it's, they're just different. They're not cottages, which were not winterized. And the Crane Cottage was a two-story wooden frame, dark wood because it was built so early in the 1900s. We will pass the cottage as we drive north, particularly to go to Point Betsy, which is a national the lighthouse there is in the National Registry for Lighthouses. It is a beautiful lighthouse on the shore of Lake Michigan where the foghorn it turns on. There used to be a light keeper when I was little, and people of the light keeper and his family lived in the lighthouse. Now it's all automated, so it's different in that way. But there's a beautiful beach there where you can have uh, beach parties where you can sit and enjoy the sunset. And as I go and look at the sunset, I will remember something that Annabelle shared with me, that she and Brad had gone to Point Betsy, and that they pulled off the road to look at this gorgeous sunset, and that while they were doing it, they were listening to the Foray Requiem, which just absolutely goes along with Brad's love of music, his love of Michigan, his love of Annabelle, and uh, he was just a very special person, and it has been my honor to have grown up knowing him and the rest of his family. Thank you, Marilyn. Uh, Ann Harris, please. Good morning. Good morning. My husband Roger and I are uh, old friends of Annabelle's and Brad's from the um, church in Washington, uh, Georgetown Presbyterian Church. Um, a couple of weeks ago, we were down here staying with Annabelle so we could go to our grandson's golf tournament. And um, one of the nights we were there, she invited Marilyn Clark, who's another transplant from the choir in Georgetown, to dinner with us. And as we sat there talking about old times together, Marilyn said, do you realize that we've been friends for 60 years? I said, 60 years? No way. But it, it really was 60 years. And then Later I thought, what in the world can have people so connected for that long a time? And the obvious reason, at least for us, is singing and singing together, um, which we did, which we all have done a lot there. I, I know Brad probably started youngest 
as he told us one time, he was the soprano soloist in a voice choir, which is hard to imagine with this low voice. Um, the, <laughs> the rest of us have, had ambled along through life singing as we got to places where we could. Um, our husband Roger and I sang together in the chapel choir at college, as did his sister Carolyn and her husband John. And um, our first visit to Georgetown was to hear John, who was the soloist both at the Georgetown and at our college choir, sing the Berlioz Santos, which is the most gorgeous thing ever. And the alto part is also fun to do. But we were blown away by the choir there and also by Bill Watkins, the director of the choir. And then later that summer, we were privileged to hear him play for Carolyn and John's wedding at the chapel uh, at her college. And it was, that, that's the days when usually organists played for weddings dun, 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 at the beginning and dun, 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 at the end, and they went home. <laughs> but not Bill. He played a wonderful compilation of beautiful music perfectly woven together to uh, just make the wedding just perfect. And um, we, at that point, were going back and forth about whether to ask his Methodist organist or my Baptist organist to play for our wedding in the fall. And Bill called us and said, would it be presumptuous of him to offer to play for our wedding? <laughs> so we said, yeah, yeah, right. So he did, and we decided to join that church and leave our Baptist and Methodist backgrounds, and we never turned back from that decision. Um, when we got there, Annabelle was in the choir, as was Marilyn and her husband Dick and Carolyn and John, so we knew a few people. Brad had not shown up yet. A year later, he came and told Raj as a fellow bass that he joined the choir only so he could be near Annabelle, <laughs> whom he had seen at the after church thing a couple of times. Um, they, uh, we watched their wooing each other back and forth for um, as long as it took till they finally got married like the rest of us. Um, let's see, where are we here? Now, the, the choir there was not a choir that just showed up on Sunday, sang an anthem, and went home. We did all sorts of interesting things, like doing the Britain Ceremony of Carols from our little balcony seats in the back while an uh, interpretive dancers leapt around upon the altar uh, to distract us from our singing. <laughs> and we, we also did a mall of the night visitors once in costumes and had pretend camels come down the front aisle. And we always had a annual trek to the National Cathedral, which is huge if you haven't seen it, to participate in the Kirken of the Tartan which is really the blessing of the little plaid skirts that Scottish people wear. <laughs> and that we did that because our minister was from Scotland and was the president of the, the heck is it? St. Andrews. Andrews, right. <laughs> and so we would go to, you have not lived till you've heard in that cavernous place, bagpipes and drums echoing around you. <laughs> It was just an amazing place to be. And while we were there in Georgetown, our friendship grew so that we, went, we started going out to brunch at this wonderful French bistro that we loved. And they, they ended up coming to our winter doldrum party we would have at the end of January every year. The first time he came, he was given the seal of approval by a very picky entity, our huge Irish setter. <laughs> Turns out he had an Irish setter at some point in his life, but our Irish setter just adored him, and they were friends for the 13 years that Spot was 
Spot was his nickname. His real name was Spot of Brandy, named by Rod. <laughs> um, anyhow, they, they were really good friends. Um, and then at, at some point after many years, the, um, we all moved through kids, kids growing up, marriages, and grandchildren. And Brad and Annabelle were supportive of all of, all of the above, all the way through all these experiences. And they, they were like honorary grandparents to our kids, in particular, my one granddaughter who is uh, musically talented, they would come all the way up to, to see her performances like, she, like they did with Aaron's and Shannon's. It was, it was so, they really appreciated the attention that they got from that. Now, she, now she's graduating in a month, and I guess the ha-ha, next thing she'll be doing is being on Broadway. <laughs> That's what she thinks anyhow. Um, she, they also, they were both very supportive to the Winters family. The um, Broadway show kind of thing that they did right after we joined the choir there. We, um, we joined after we kept moving farther and farther away from the church in Washington. We now live on the eastern shore of Maryland, which was way over an hour each way. So we, we ended up looking and totally lucked out and found First Presbyterian of Annapolis and the Winters in, in the process. Um, and the, uh, at the Broadway thing, Marilyn did an a act dressed like a nun, which was really neat. <laughs> and Brian did a duet with one of his daughters. It, it was, and people did really fun things. It was a fundraising effort for the choir's trip to Europe that, the next summer. Um, we, when Brad and Annabelle moved down here, we would come and visit back and forth. And down here, we would be taken on these wonderful tours of Colonial, Williamsburg, and to Jamestown and things like that. And so they come up to our house and sit around and eat. And, <laughs> and I thought, well, there's got to be something we can do here. I mean, Annapolis is old, too. So I finally thought, aha, when they came up the next time, I said, we're going sailing on this old wooden sailboat out of Annapolis for a three-hour tour, hopefully not with the same result as the one on TV. So off we went to sail. It was late fall. We got there and we hopped on the, well, Roger and Annabelle hopped on. Brad and I lumbered up as best we could. <laughs> and we got on there and no sooner got away, the sun went away, the wind came up, we nearly froze. And that was it. Raj, in a moment of uh, chivalry, offered his coat to Annabelle, but still the three of us were like, please let us live through this, while Brad was in his element, ah, this is no, no, face to the wind, no, no, no problems at all with the, the freezing cold and the wind. We got back to the dock alive. <laughs> Lord. We had, we had not even dressed warmly because we were going to Maryland and Brian's for dinner afterwards and we thought we should look halfway decent, not in little ice cubes. When we got back, I was apologizing for putting them through this and Brad goes, ah, oh, it was a wonderful sail. Reminds me of Michigan. <laughs> Sailing on the, on the lake. Of Every thought of ever going with them to Michigan flitted right out of my head. <laughs> oh, man. Um, I, the, when Brad got sick, he did everything he could, investigated everything he could to know what he could do best to fight it. And that included coming from Williamsburg on the train monthly for treatments. And when he did, he had, they had to stay close to the hospital for the treatments, and so we would come pick them up for dinner each time, or almost each time, um, which was not ideal, but at least we got to see each other for a while. Um, meantime, Marilyn 
was back there giving them everything they needed uh, to be taken care of down here. She functioned as, as chauffeur and gopher and everything. It was, it was wonderful of her to do that. She's still doing it now. In fact, last night she was helping with dinner uh, when we had dinner together. Um, the losses add up as we get older. And this one is, has been a, a particularly heavy one because Brad was such a wonderful and exceptional person. And all of us that love him and love Annabelle will be missing him for as long as we're here to miss him. Um, so that's it about that. <laughs> Thank you, Ann. I'd like to call on John Berg. Good morning. As I reflected on the uh, 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 request to uh, uh, try to uh, offer my thoughts, uh, emotions of the moment, uh, uh, and uh, uh, memories of the Brad that I knew, which was the Brad uh, uh, in the last half century of his life when he was married to Annabelle, of course, uh, uh, I realized that that's a hard thing to do. All right, and uh, I, I sat down and and, uh, and uh, having uh, quickly appreciated the difficulty in doing that, uh, I did some head scratching and some note taking. Uh, I'm a retired engineer, so naturally I think in terms of tables and numbers and analytical sorts of things. Uh, uh, the very kinds of uh, of things that Brad in his background of uh, appreciation of the arts uh, 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 would be completely different in, a, in, uh, in a training for doing what I'm doing before you uh, right this minute. Uh, but I realized that what a difficult thing that is for me to do. Uh, uh, the Brad I knew was, uh, 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 I, I'm trying to capture uh, the will of the wisp here, please understand. Uh, but uh, I have the uh, profound memory of someone who loved Annabelle for half a century in ways and with gestures and with reality that set such a standard and was such an example for everyone else in the family, a legacy that will endure forever and my children and, and their children who yet are yet to come. Uh, uh, I have uh, always enjoyed when I have had a chance to visit with Annabelle and Brad uh, 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 and when they would leave me alone in the living room, it was a chance for me to kind of wander along and look at the books that they kept in their library in, uh, in the living room. I've always found that a chance to look at the kinds of books someone accumulates is an interesting window into how they think, where they come from, how they view the world, how they, uh, 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 how they view what's interesting about life, and never mind what's funny about life. And I have every visit I had made uh, uh, when I would get a chance to visit with them every two or three or whatever it was years, there would be changes in the library that I would absorb and go away with uh, a refreshed appreciation of the depth of uh, uh, Brad and Annabelle's uh, appreciation of, of all the classics, not just in, in uh, uh, music, about which, of course, we've heard so much today, uh, but uh, also in uh, 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 the literary arts, in architecture, uh, in classics, in things as, as, as diverse as sailboat design and classic automobiles. 
Um, as a youth, I uh, did some sailing, and I have a lifelong interest in old cars. And, and so Brad and I never lacked for things to talk about uh, when we would get together. But the, uh, the richness in uh, 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 their appreciation of, of the many, many dimensions of, of uh, life beyond the daily grind of earning a living and, uh, and living life uh, never failed to impress me and, uh, and has served as such a wonderful example to everyone else in the family that's had the, the pleasure to, to know them. Um, uh, as some of you know, that uh, my mother, uh, uh, Annabelle and, and my mother, uh, lived with Brad and Annabelle for many years in her later years. Uh, uh, and uh, Brad was just such a wonderful source of uh, uh, relentless affection and good nature and willingness to serve and, and love from morning to night uh, to my mother, my mother, which took great uh, 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 energy and strength and relentless sense of humor for so many years and which contributed so much to her later years, the golden years. He helped make her years golden for sure for which uh, uh, I, for one, will be forever grateful to him. Um, uh, Brad was uh, 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 such a good example of Midwestern warmth, if I can uh, dare say such a thing, if that doesn't sound parochial to, for me to stand here as a Midwesterner and say that to uh, some of you from that part of the country anyway. Uh, so outgoing so interested in how he may serve others and demonstrating that with actions that he took to uh, brighten the days of all those that he encountered. Uh, uh, just such a, uh, uh, a marvelous person to have had the pleasure to have known. And uh, uh, so I, I, I conclude with, uh, with uh, uh, having come around to the thinking that that it's difficult for me to capture the will of the wisp that is the essence of this marvelous, wondrous heart uh, in a totally unique human being, that that task is difficult is a good thing, right? Isn't that in itself a testament to what a magic human being uh, and magic things that he did as he moved through his life affecting all of our lives? I will be eternally uh, armed with that knowledge and grateful for his having uh, given me some of that uh, that has brought me here today to uh, share my few thoughts with you. Uh, uh, Brad's heart and his wondrous experience and uh, example for all of us is as here today and as real today as it was all those nearly half century that I knew him. And I know all of us will take that with us as we leave, uh, leave this, this gathering here today. Thank you for your time today. It's a wonderful experience to have shared your thoughts with my thoughts. Thank you, John, and I encourage all of us to share our memories of Brad as we gather together and uh, fellowship together. It is a, a wonderful uh, time for us to remember him and to give thanks to God for his life. I would invite you, as you are able to stand, as we uh, say our affirmation of faith, of the faith in which Brad believed. In life and in death, we belong to God through the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit. We trust in the one triune God, the Holy One of Israel, whom alone we worship and serve. With believers in every time and place, we rejoice that nothing in life or in death can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated.
Beloved, will you join with me in prayer? Holy and gracious God, we are grateful for the life and ministry of your servant, Brad Crane. He was your beloved servant who knew that you were his help, his keeper, his refuge and strength. We are grateful, O oh Lord, that you continue to be our refuge and strength as we remember Brad's life and legacy. He, Brad was filled with your joy, and it was evident in his love for his family, friends, and life. Grant us such a deep-seated joy that we too might shine with your light and love for all creation. We praise you for the gift of music, for the music that Brad helped to make alongside others. May the music we make bring glory and honor to you, O oh God, our rock and our redeemer. When we feel troubled and overwhelmed by grief, be present with us, Lord. Send your spirit to be our advocate, to be your presence with us, comforting us. We know that while tears may come with the night, joy comes with the morning light. Night and day, our tears of sorrow and joy are all part of this process of grief. Yet we know and trust that in sharing of our memories of Brad, that the inheritance he now experiences is ours to experience alongside him. For in you, we are made one and are able to trust that nothing in life or in death can separate us from your love from us. In Christ's name we pray, amen. Beloved, I invite you to stand as you are able as we sing hymn number 687, Our God, Our Help in Ages Past. Annabelle would like to invite all of you to a reception following this service in Stevenson Hall where you can have a chance uh, to greet her and to have some refreshments. 
Jesus said, Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. Let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, Spirit and the everlasting love of our God be with you and everyone you love, now and forevermore. Amen.